Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of our amazing educational seminars. Uh, these seminars are going really, really well and uh, getting a lot of engagement on our YouTube channel. If you ever register for a seminar and you miss it, don't worry because the recording will be still sent to you afterwards. And if you miss one or you hear about one that you've missed, you can always view them on our YouTube channel or via the seminars link from your Mag Connect login. Today, we have the very amazing clinical psychologist uh, from Proof of Character, Dr. Tim Doyle. And uh, Tim has an interesting focus on, on people and teams and uh, organizational function, um, as well as a wide range of experience in medico legal work. Tim's seminar today promises to be very, very interesting. So strap in and sit back. At the end of the seminar, there will be time for you to ask some questions. Thank you so much. And over to you, Tim. Uh, Michelle, thank you very much for that for that uh, glowing endorsement. I just hope now I live up to the billing. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me this afternoon. Can I start off by thanking Michelle and Sophia for putting in all the hard yards behind the scenes to get this afternoon's talk actually happening and a, a, a viable thing? Uh, simply without that, this doesn't happen, and I don't get the opportunity to present some ideas to you. Uh, so to Michelle and to Sophia, before anything else happens, thank you very much for all the efforts leading up to to now and then all the other ones to get this up on YouTube and working. Uh, let me start the presentation and I'll share it. There we go. Move that. All right, so this talk today is, uh, I'll just move this little thing around, is on clinical psychology and in particular clinical psychology and assessments and the value of using psychological tests as part of those assessments. Uh, to my introduction before anything else, uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, I recognise and acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present in that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. A little bit about me before we keep going. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, and I work in, in the kind of intersection between clinical psychology and corporate psychology. So mm, the bulk of my experience to date has been in the area of uh, clinical psych, um, performing uh, assessments, uh, therapeutic interventions with uh, mainly adults and teens. I started off working with kids and families uh, and was just drawn into working with adults and teens. I, I swore when I began my training that the groups I didn't want to work with were adults and teenagers. I, I loved working with kids and loved working with families. Um, and my uh, first job after I'd finished at the, the doctorate at, at Deakin Uni was working with teenagers and adults uh, in an early psychosis service. And I don't think I've looked back since. Uh, so my, my main experience is, is as a clean psych in terms of diagnosis, assessments uh, and treatment. I've moved that over time increasingly into what you consider human factors assessments. In the modern age, there'll be, and you'll have come across this within your workplaces, a lot of talk about psychosocial risks, psychosocial hazards, preventing psychological injury, preventing psychological strain, how to um, not only prevent these injuries, but if an individual is injured and is injured in part or in full due to exposure to a psychological hazard uh, and the risks that are there involved, how do you get them back to work and back to work effectively? How do you deal effectively with the psychosocial hazard? The human factors assessment looks in part at hazards, but also very much at the both strengths and the risks or vulnerabilities that individuals possess. And how they might interact with psychosocial hazards. Uh, one example of psychosocial hazard, one psychosocial hazard is considered to be um, isolation at work. Uh, you can understand then that in simple terms, someone who's extroverted and loves working in a team is going to find working in isolation unpleasant. That for them is not only exposure to a, a psychosocial hazard, but they have their own vulnerability for that to be a particular risk to them. Uh, someone who's a, a, an introverted loner who prefers their own space and doesn't really like working with people 
would be fine in an environment where isolation was a significant component of their work. So human factors assessments looks at that sort of information around individuals. Uh, I also am involved with the, the last line on the slide, determining someone's fit for a role, uh, whether they're fit for the promotion, um, assessing various forms of leadership, the culture that different leaders create, uh, all of this broadly speaking falls under the heading of talent and risk assessment. Uh, and uh, workplace culture assessments. But today isn't concerned with most of that. Today is around clinical psychology and in, in, uh, the medico legal scope and the ways in which uh, a clinical psychologist can be useful, how I practice as a clinic psych, um, how a clinical psychologist is different to a psychiatrist, uh, the kind of practical concerns around what does an assessment look like, how long does it take, what do you get out of it, and the kind of cases and questions that might be useful for employers and insurers to send to a clinical psychologist. And I'll try to spend on the last half of the talk in particular, looking at that issue, how uh, cases particularly, and, and how psych assessment and psych testing are particularly useful and particularly revealing in these sorts of cases. I wanna start here though. How is a clinical psychologist different to a psychiatrist? And I want to start here because my experience is most people don't understand the differences between clinical psychology and consultant psychiatry. They've never been exposed to it. And so I think it's a useful spot to begin. The first is in qualifications. Uh, a consultant psychiatrist is primarily a medical practitioner. They complete um, whatever their pre-qualifications are and then qualifications in medicine. And then they specialise for a couple of years at least in psychiatry. This involves rotations generally through outpatient, inpatient units within hospitals, um, sometimes working in areas where they're seeing quite severe and, and rare forms of mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, very severe obsessive compulsive disorder, severe personality disorders, um, severe and largely treatment resistant depressive illness. Uh, and also those areas of hospitals where they get exposed to the interaction between mental health and physical health concerns. Uh, and they're qualified to diagnose mental illness. Clinical psychologist is not a medical practitioner. I have no medical training whatsoever. Uh, however, what I am trained in is understanding human development, human relationships, identities, and coping. So the focus of my training hasn't been on um, the, the biology of people, although there's some interest in that, particularly when it comes to understanding brains and brain behaviour. Uh, my focus is on normal human development, what childhood has been like, how that influences someone's development over time, family, relationships with parents, um, relationships with peers, romantic relationships over time, how an individual finds their place in society, uh, how people are best assessed in terms of fitting in with their work roles, how work leads to a sense of identity, how humans adjust. Uh, and if you think about it, there are lots of adjustments we need to make through various phases of our life. What does healthy adaptation to stress and pressure look like? What does maladaptive adaptation to stress and pressure look like? What's resilience? What, what is it actually? How do you understand an individual's resilience and how do you understand what their environment, the world they're part of, the, the relationships or systems that they're part of, and in terms of resilience or detract from it? In terms of treatment, a clinical psychologist cannot comment on medications. I have a working understanding of some medications, but I'm not trained in it. I cannot legally prescribe medications. Uh, and if there's a, a, a question in an IME about whether a particular medication is appropriate, I cannot address it. Consultant psychiatrists have a, quite a profound expertise in this area. Uh, they're very good at diagnosis and they're very good at understanding medications and they're uh, consultant psychs are great when you're looking at that interaction between a physical health problem and a mental health problem and you're trying to understand um, what's medication doing, how these things interacting, how are these two conditions interacting. That's a, a, an area of real strength for consultant psychiatrists. The treatment that I've been trained in, the clinical psychologists are generally trained in, is talking therapy. So cognitive behaviour therapy or CBT, dialectic behaviour therapy, DBT, um, ACT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy. These are strong areas of focus in clinical psych. 
Psychiatrists have some sort of working familiarity with this. Often they go and do more kind of professional development once qualified, but it's not a strong part of uh, psychiatry's focus. My experience practically is, is that most psychiatrists don't engage in talking therapy. Um, they'll engage in medication and some supportive counselling, but they're not involved in formal psychotherapy as such. What we know about psychotherapy is that for particular people and particular problems, it's extremely effective. Um, and in general terms, it's as effective, if not more effective, than medication for most problems. There are some areas yeah, where medication... Right. Thank you. There are some areas where medication is clearly superior, uh, particularly in things like the treatment of severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Even in those areas, talking therapies can have quite a useful impact. The other area of some both similarity and difference is in the assessment process. Clinical psychologists and psychiatrists are both trained in understanding mental illness and its diagnosis. Uh, a clinical psychologists uh, are recognised as pulled out of a cupboard. <laughs> similar to uh, uh, <laughs> practitioners on the same level as medical practitioners, like GPs, in terms of their ability to make a diagnosis. When it comes to assessment, both psychologists and psychiatrists are trained to use um, the interviews to try to understand a person, what's going on for them, um, what's relevant in terms of their personal life, their history, their circumstances, and symptoms of mental illness. Clinical psychologists are in particular trained to use structured and semi-structured interviews. These are formal methods of collecting data and holding it. And what we know from research around the assessment of illness is that uh, unstructured interviews risk becoming unreliable. And it makes a bit of sense. Unstructured interviews uh, are informed by... Uh, the kind of wealth of professional experience you have but when they're unstructured the risk is you forget to ask things there's not a prompt in front of you you've just got a notepad and firing questions away and getting answers and that might be very effective but the risk is you miss things um, you forget to ask things uh, you don't document things against the points you need to remember it's just more open to normal human faults and failings semi-structured interviews contain any number of prompts about the different areas of an assessment you must focus on uh, makes it less likely to forget things, much, much more likely that you're going to organise your information effectively. And I think the biggest difference really between the assessments that a clinical psychologist does and that I do in practice uh, to a psychiatrist is the use of formal psychometric tools. I'll talk about these in a bit more detail in a minute. Uh, but these add a fair bit to your assessment. For starters, uh, they're well normed and they're objective so that you can measure the presence of something, let's say depressive symptoms, how depressed someone is uh, against what you know people in the normal population feel who are not depressed and what you know people who are diagnosed as depressed can feel. So you can have a look at, at different populations and know where someone sits versus the normal every day and versus a more clinical population that has a diagnostic level of the severity of illness. Uh, the great advantage to tests is they don't forget to ask a question. They're thorough in their assessments. They're a great way of checking what you're doing. Uh, and furthermore, uh, as long as the test is at a relatively high professional standard, they're defensible in court. Your professional opinion is supported by well-documented, scientifically supported, empirically verified tests. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense and it's useful. Imagine seeing a GP, you've got a health concern and you see a GP. And the GP says, well, based on what you tell me, I think you've got a cholesterol problem. Compare that to see a GP and the GP goes through an interview with you and then sends you off for a blood test and you come back a week later and the GP says, well, based on what you told me and based on the blood test results, I put these two things together and I think you've got a cholesterol problem. Which one do you think is more valid? Which one do you believe more? Which one can you trust more? Uh, we don't think about whether or not testing in a medical circumstance is worthwhile 
it's expected. In fact, if you reverse it and think, uh, I went to the GP and the GP did no testing and said I had a cholesterol problem, you'd wonder about whether it was valid or not. You'd wonder whether you could trust the results or, or you'd wonder about whether the GP really knew what they were doing. In this area, in the assessment of mental illness, the tests that psychologists use, these sorts of uh, kind of psychometric tools are very robust. And when you look at the research results that compare medical tests and their real world validity with psychological tests that assess mental illness and their real world validity, psychological tests often match up very well are equal to, and in some cases, superior to. It depends on the thing. It depends on the problem. Depends, depends. Uh, but they match up quite comfortably in medical tests. They have pretty much the same level of validity, the same level of real-world meaning. Given that, it strikes me as crazy not to use them. Thinking about uh, clinical psychology and practice in terms of IMEs and assessments, and assessments broadly, there are two areas that I think clinical psychology can speak to pretty well. The first is role suitability. And that is, again, through interviews and through the right psychometric tools, it can be uh, determined, you can start to figure out um, whether someone is suitable for a role, whether they fit the actual job that they are employed to do. You need to know what the job role is and you need to know what the, the, the outcome of the role or the KPIs are for a role. Uh, when you're doing role suitability assessments, Assessing IQ is really important. It's important to know how, how, what, what the intellectual demands of a role are going to be and then be able to measure someone's uh, capacity against those demands. You can use pretty reliable psychological tests to predict the likelihood of someone fitting a role. The example I gave earlier on, an extrovert versus an introvert in a role that you know is going to have significant amounts of, of isolation, for example. With role suitability, you can look for risks or derailers um, in the in the kind of organisational psych or corporate psych world. These are these are um, euphemistically called overused strengths. Um, uh, for example, uh, when someone who is generally speaking goal oriented and uh, perhaps a bit brash and a bit confident can, under stress, tip towards being narcissistic and demanding. Uh, role suitability assessments are different to fitness for duty assessments. Fitness for duty are looking at um, whether, whether during a pre-employment phase um, or when employed, looking at the interaction between mental health personality and capacity to perform the inherent requirements of a role. So the fitness for duty assessments as compared to a role suitability assessment, look at the ability for an individual to function, perform a role, and whether or not their ability to function is being impacted to whatever degree by a formal forms of mental impairment. Fitness for duty assessments as part of IMEs or an example of an IME uh, can provide treatment recommendations uh, and can provide recommendations regarding accommodations or modifications of work. And I think this area is a useful one to think about in terms of working with psychologists, clinical psychologists in particular because it's, it can be so very, very messy. You can be faced with problems where you're trying to think through whether someone can work, can they work under stress, uh, how much stress is reasonable, what's a reasonable expectation for how much we can grade the, this person's reintroduction to work and expose them to stress, how much is too much, how much is worth, is responsible, how much is irresponsible. When you think about exposure to stress, and you'll know this from your own experience, there are times where you need to learn to perform under pressure. You need to learn to perform when it's stressful. Your role requires that you perform when it's stressful. You want to see from yourself an ability to perform when it's stressful. You want to prove to your teammates you can perform under some degree of duress or demand. When we're thinking about return to work, how do we grade that? How do, we, how do we give someone a sense of stress that they can still perform under and get a sense of achievement? Think, okay, I can do this. I can get back to this. I actually can perform and perform when it's not easy. I feel much better about myself. I'm tired, but I feel better. How much is too much stress and pushes people beyond their level of coping when returning to work? These are the kind of questions that 
uh, an assessment that a clinical psych can help address. And through the process of the assessment combined with standardized uh, psychometric tests or measures can help you quantify how stressed an individual is and, and where you can modify a role successfully so that you can get people back to work, either modify their duties and modify their hours or a combination and hit these targets, expose them to enough stress that's manageable for reintroduction and then time things a little so that they can get a sense of achievement uh, while still uh, more and more approximating the demands of the role they're employed to perform. So for me, the IME assessment process is pretty straightforward. Um, I'll gather background through the letter of instruction. Uh, what I like doing with everyone that I see is going through a brief pre-assessment conversation just to review the material I've been sent and get a sense of what the case is about. Sometimes individuals can, when they refer uh, an assessment to me, can struggle putting things into words about exactly what they want me to determine. Uh, and I'm, I want to be clear about this. Having a pre-assessment chat, I don't think biases my opinion about how a case is going to go. Um, I've been exposed to uh, enough individuals being assessed and enough workplaces, I think, to be relatively um, switched on to uh, influences uh, on my opinion that are undue or unnecessary. Uh, but I still prefer to do pre-assessment chats because they help uncover things. And they also help reveal things that people haven't thought about telling me. Um, for example, I, I finished an assessment this morning and part of the pre-assessment chat actually revealed the individual I was going to assess had a history of really good work performance several years earlier and a string of promotions. Uh, that wasn't in the reasons that they were being referred to me. And so that information wasn't in the letter of instruction, but it's really important information to get about the worker. Uh, so after a, a, the brief pre-assessment conversation, I'll go through a tailored clinical interview takes about one and a half hours to two hours in, in terms of time. I find that doing an interview of less than 60 minutes and it's really just a surface effort, you're brushing over stuff and you're not really understanding why that person is in front of you and what's going on. Uh, I also find that if you progress past two hours, you just really tire the person out and, and you'll get beyond my own city to... to you know, remember everything I'm being told, properly take notes, muster all my concentration in the right sort of way. I then administer, score and interpret relevant psychometric tests for straightforward IMEs, fitness for duty assessments. I'll generally use one, one of two what we call omnibus tests, big broad tests that measure lots of areas of functioning. There are occasions where I've needed to do several follow-up tests. I oh, mean, there was one individual that comes to mind quickly uh, whom I did an assessment with and rapidly figured out that the individual had a single episode of depression and they were recovering well from that and able to get back to work. The reason they'd been sent to me is that the GP had been sending in the relatively standard medical certificates with no information about diagnosis, treatment, recovery, uh, risk, anything. It was that to trigger the IME. However, when talking with the individual, they, rem they, they remarked on a number of difficulties they had performing their role. And it became pretty quickly apparent that once I'd gone through their um, childhood history, albeit briefly, they had long-standing concerns about attention, concentration, impulsivity, etc. And so one of the reasons that they'd become depressed was feeling overwhelmed in their job. One of the reasons they were overwhelmed, because as it came out through the assessment, I was pretty confident they had an undiagnosed case of attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Uh, now this... It's relatively rare for these things to come out that way. Uh, and in this instance, again, I used more than just the standard battery of tests or the standard test. Um, I used a small um, standard set of tests I use when I'm looking at ADHD as a thing. So most of the time it's just one. Sometimes it's more than one. Uh, there's a case in the cases that I'll talk about in a few minutes where I used a number of different tests. Uh, but again, that's pretty specific. If I get permission, I'll contact treating practitioners um, where relevant and where I've, get, where I've got, the, again, written consent, and I get the chance to speak to the practitioner. I always think this is good because it's great to get someone else's perspective um, and hopefully a long treatment history, uh, a GP or a psychologist, psychiatrist, someone who's been treating an individual for a lengthy period. It's fantastic to um, get that information, challenge my own hypotheses and thinking, 
uh, get a, a thorough sense of treatment. Often people can be overwhelmed with you know, what they've done in therapy and struggle to tell you or what medications they've tried over time. If they've tried several and forget the names, uh, going to treaters is great because you can cover off that information and complete a report. The organisations I work with are all pretty good. We complete reports in five to ten business days. Don't go beyond it. Psychometrics, the tests, the tests themselves, you can look at all sorts of different things. And depending on the role and depending on the question, I look at issues around intellectual ability, attention or memory, personality, psychopathology. That just means the various symptoms of mental illness. Uh, one of the tests, two of the tests that I use are very good measures of both personality and a lot of different areas of psychopathology. So we can measure symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of kind of fear and panic separately, symptoms of trauma, depression, uh, symptoms of health anxiety or health concerns, impulsivity, drug abuse, stress, uh, and then separate to that, things like degrees of social support, uh, sense of optimism and motivation to return to work, sense of optimism and also engagement in their own treatment. Uh, psychometrics, as I mentioned earlier, can be used for role suitability, such as job suitability, uh, and you can use psychological tests that measure effort or motivation and response bias. And I think that's a particularly important one, and I'll get to that here. So why do we use tests? One of the answers is just because of the reality of people. I gave the example earlier of a GP, and, and uh, I asked you to imagine your own level of comfort with a GP telling you had a cholesterol problem and no information to support it versus a GP telling you had a cholesterol problem and blood test data they could demonstrate to. What we find is that with people, you can't just ask them how they are. And that, when I say it, it must sound obvious for everyone. You can't just ask people how they are and expect to get a full response. And in an IME, this is an even weirder circumstance, people are being sent to see me. They're not wrapped to come and see me. They're not jumping out of their skin in the morning thinking, hooray, I get to be you know, weighed up and measured by a random psychologist for a purpose I can't control. That's a pretty intimidating circumstance. You know, I can make it as nice and pleasant as I want. It's an intimidating and unpleasant circumstance. So how do you get an accurate sense of what's going on for people? One of the primary reasons you use tests is because a couple of the tests that I use in particular have been developed over decades to try and measure the kind of influences on how people will engage in testing and respond. So you can weigh up this issue. How are they actually doing the test and how are they giving the information? What, what we know is that there are some people who exaggerate stuff. The, the kind of common example of this is the person you know, who, who has a cold and says they have the flu. You know, the fish is always this big. They, you know, so they, they always make the most out of their symptoms. Um, it's a kind of unconscious exaggeration. They just exaggerate stuff. You find that there are people who will, on tests, say that everything's wrong. Everything is wrong. Everything possible is wrong. It's, everything is coming down on top of them. We call this a cry for help profile. It's, a, it's an exaggeration of everything, but it's a kind of unsophisticated manipulation. They're not doing it to deliberately trick you. They're doing it as if to shake you, you know, take me seriously, everything is rubbish. That's the kind of uh, effort they're going through. We also know there are people who um, make it up, who say things that are happening to them that are not happening to them. And then we know people who do this um, and they do it to obtain some sort of reward or advantage in their circumstances. We call that malingering. Uh, all of these things are, are, are part of a group of responses that we call negative impression management, trying to come over um, as more unwell or suffering more greatly or experiencing symptoms that either you don't or you don't at this intensity or severity. And a couple of the tests in particular are really good at spotting the degree to which this is happening and even helping being able to identify what type of exaggeration is going on. Is this just your normal garden variety, almost unconscious exaggeration? The person who describes themselves as having the flu when they actually just have a cough. 
Or is this someone who is quite deliberately trying to say they're experiencing a large number and severity of particular symptoms and there's just no way they are? The other thing to think about with responses are those people who don't want to tell you that they're not well. You'll all know people who are really proud, who, who don't want to come across as unwell, who don't want to admit they have problems. You know, their house will be on fire, but they'll ask you how you are and whether you want a cup of tea. They, they, they will push away all the problems that they're having within themselves. They might even deny them to themselves. They might not be aware of just how shocking things are. We call that positive impression management, trying to, trying to come across as, as immune to the normal human stresses and strains of, of working in the world uh, or of possessing, you know, unrealistic degrees of virtue uh, or personal strength. So tests are really useful because they help inform us about these things. And without tests, unless the example is extreme, you're guessing. You don't know how much of an influence there is of this stuff. Uh, you just don't. You just don't, unless it's extreme and really obvious. Uh, using tests and alongside structured or semi-structured interviewing is the most valid method of assessment. Again, when you go to the research articles and research work that's gone on over many decades, but how to get the most accurate, the most valid, the most well-informed and most likely to be true answer when doing diagnostic assessments, doing something called multi-trait, multi-method assessments, using different ways of getting access to information to assess the same and also different bits of the puzzle, is the most accurate, the most valid way of doing anything in this area. It's the height of best practice. Using tests is the most analytical way of working. It helps uncover what's illness, what's personality, what's a bit of both. Uh, it also helps you understand what's a chronic problem that's just gotten worse. What's a new problem and those circumstances where it's a bit of both? I want to just speak to this a little bit. You all know people who exaggerate their concerns. You know, they have the flu and they, and they cough. And you all know people who will tell you they're fine when you know they are not fine. And they will soldier on no matter what. And what that tells you and what, and what we already know and what I know you already know is that in part, it matters more to understand what type of person has the problem than what type of problem the person has. Um, and this is an old, old, old quote coming from Hippocrates, the father of medicine. Uh, psych testing helps you do this. It helps you understand what type of person has the problem because ultimately it's that understanding, what type of person do I have in front of me that helps you do everything else? If you don't understand the type of person that's in front of you, how do you make a return to work plan? Um, basic training in these areas, uh, mental health, uh, illness, therapy, can help you say, oh, well, now I know for depression that the most useful thing is a combination between antidepressants and somewhere between 12 and 16 sessions of cognitive behavior therapy. That works reasonably well for a large group of people. It should work reasonably well for you. You don't need someone like me to tell you that. Google can tell you that. But the testing tells you about the human. And you need to know, is this person someone who's going to kick back against authority? Because if we put them back into work and they're already kind of having friction, wrapping up badly with their manager, this is not going to work. The depression doesn't tell me that, their personality does. It's the person. Uh, is this person someone who's going to be deeply ashamed of their illness and not reach out for help? So a manager, as well-meaning as they're trying to be, can't keep tabs on what's going on for them because this person will shy away no matter how, how, how concerned and wanting, how engaged and connected that manager is trying to be. The second part, it helps you tell what's going on, uh, whether this issue is just a, a, a kind of the aggravation of a chronic or pre-existing condition, uh, a brand new one, or a mix of the two. And again, 
when you're looking at doing this without testing, you're making a, an educated and well-informed and experienced guess. Testing helps challenge your thinking and it helps back it up. And that brings you to the last part. This is the most legally defensible way of working. Using structured or semi-structured interviewing and psychometric testing is the most defensible way of working. Now, your tests have got to be at the standard. Uh, that said, uh, at least in the US, there are well-established standards around psychological testing and what is defensible in court. That's less prescribed here in Australia, uh, but those the tests are still subject to challenge and tests that are well picked with good psychometric support, that is the science behind the evidence showing that they work uh, and that they are appropriately used for the job you've put them to, put you in a very strong position where matters to become adversarial and legal in nature. All right, so some cases that I'll run to. Uh, first case, a case of highly unlikely dysfunction, otherwise known as I ate or grooming tablets. Um, I was referred to assess uh, a person who had been working for a federal government department in a middle management role. And there had been a series of run-ins with uh, managers one up from this individual and some confusion about work roles, who was doing what, uh, how that was supposed to be working, what parts of jobs were going to be taken on, whether various uh, programs of work were going to be rolled out through this government department or not, who was managing them, who was informing them, what was the right time scale, et cetera. Uh, there was also a bit of office politics that was running around at the same time. After a period of time, this individual began working from home and then ceased work altogether. Their complaint primarily was of suffering from such severe depression due to uh, the overwhelming work demands and kind of undermining nature of the managers in question that they had suffered a mental breakdown. As part of this assessment, I went through my normal clinical interview and one psych test. What was evident pretty quickly was that the claim dysfunction wasn't there. And it certainly wasn't there to the, to the degree it had been described. The description of the dysfunction went along these lines. Uh, I can't read an email. I put my clothes in the rubbish bin and I put my rubbish in the washing machine and I washed my rubbish. I got out of my car and left the doors open and so when it rained, my car flooded. I drive down to the local shops but I don't know where I am. The local shops were about five minutes from home. Uh, and then the, the one on the slide, um, I was so confused about what my medication was and what my dog's medication was that I ate the dog worming tablets. In this assessment, um, the, the individual in question, uh, quit the interview and the, the psych test on interview, um, they were lovely, uh, they were clever, uh, they were quick, verbally really quick, well-humoured, uh, spent about two and a half hours of interview with me making not a single error in terms of um, plotting time, what happened and when, uh, the sequence of events, um, life and childhood and school experiences, uh, personal relationships, career over time. Uh, was able to, in their study, grab folders full of documentation, uh, printouts of emails and policy and the like, uh, to suggest that they could send me bits and pieces of this. Uh, and then after the interview sent me what was about a four screen length email detailing a number of events that we hadn't gone through. So it was evident on, on interview that the individual had great concentration, a relatively buoyant mood, thought very flexibly and was able to speak um, in an articulate and competent way across a number of problems showing no degree of disturbance in their mood. So their presentation didn't match 
their description uh, of, of kind of maladjustment and illness. And to back that up on the psych test in question, uh, it was evident that they had claimed a degree of illness that should see them immediately hospitalised to protect them from themselves, such with a level of risk involved. And it just wasn't evident at all, not only on interview, uh, but the, the, the clash between the interview and the site testing data was quite remarkable. Finally, there are a number of subscales on the psychological test that measure exaggeration and deliberate exaggeration rather than kind of unconscious or cry for help patterns. And these were all highly elevated. Not just one of them, all of the ones I used were highly elevated. So the combination of the interview at the, and, the, and this person's presentation and the site testing gave me great confidence at saying the individual had been feigning symptoms. I didn't know enough about the individual circumstance in a single um, and still relatively brief interview to be absolutely confident this was a case of malingering. I suspected it was, couldn't determine given the brevity of the assessment, but I was very confident that the individual in question had feigned their symptoms. Um, I was recently sent a case uh, to assess where uh, a gentleman had suffered a foot injury at work. He'd initially suffered a back injury and that had healed quite quickly, uh, but his job involved a lot of walking around and going up lots of sets of stairs. And at, at one point in time, he said he had an injured foot. He got multiple phys physio assessments and all of the physio reports are that the foot injury was present, but very mild and should recover and recover uh, fully, just given a little bit of time and the usual sort of physio exercises specific to the injury. Within about three months, the individual in question described developing panic disorder, going off work completely and submitting a work cover claim, largely because they stated that the foot injury was so severe that it had caused them uh, to have an extreme degree of fear about returning to work and the degree to which they would be supported in the workplace. Going through the assessment, um, and this, this remains one of my more fascinating assessments, because of the, the reactions involved were so strange. Uh, going through the assessment, it was evident through the interview, the individual in question was, um, I guess I'd frame it as a bit of a nervous sort, um, uncertain, somewhat self-doubting, questioning, um, if I asked a question, would then be worried about why I asked the question. And once we completed the interview and I talked through the test, the person then became very nervous and started rocking kind of back and forth and talked through that, calmed him, started off the test. The testing question takes about an hour maybe an hour and 15 minutes to complete. This person took almost three and a half hours to complete this test. And while, while I was uh, there, uh, this was a video-based assessment. And so I, I, when I'm doing a video-based assessment, I always observe individuals complete the test so I can make sure that they're not you know, on their phones or asking for help. Uh, and what I observed him do, and he knew I was there the whole time, what I observed him do was rock back and forward, hug himself, rub his head, bang his head on the table, uh, kind of collapse over the table, stand up, sit down. This went on. After about three hours, uh, he was informed uh, by the uh, office workers that they had to shut the building, had to shut the office. This then led to all of that behaviour that had gone on for three hours stopping, dead, just stopped, completely stopped. He then completed the rest of the test at 20 minutes' time, with not, not a twitch to be seen. When I looked at the data, what was evident that his display to me was a gross overreaction to the, situ the situation. The testing question uh, puts a statement on the screen and you have to answer it either true or false, depending on what you think of it. And that's it. That, that's, the, that's the kind of psychological demand of it. And there are a number of what, what seem to be you know, irrelevant or relatively bland questions. Um, things like, uh, um, 
Now, I like to go to the theatre. I enjoy chocolate cake. Now, I like a fire on a warm night, on a cold night. Those sorts of questions. True, false, true, false, true. Uh, and what was evident looking at the, the content of the data was that he'd exaggerated again significantly, exaggerated the degree of uh, uh, distress he was feeling and the likelihood uh, of him having a, a panic disorder as a result of his foot injury. What was evident was that his personality was such that he was someone who really wanted looking after. He was someone who wanted, if he said, I have an injury, he wanted his manager to say, oh, mate, are you all right? How are you going? Do you want some time off? And, and to have these kind of overt displays of care. However, because the workplace didn't behave like this at all, there was a sense from him of being quite hurt and perhaps even a little angry about the way he had not been treated that he wished to be treated. He wished to be looked after and a bit of a fuss made about him. This didn't happen. And the more it didn't happen, the more he became anxious. Did people really like him? Uh, was this really working at work? How's all this going? Am I okay? Are they okay with me? Which made him more anxious, which meant when he went to work, he'd noticed that his foot was even more sore, which meant that he'd then limp more, which made his foot worse, which then made him more anxious. And then when no one cared, he got more anxious, which made his foot worse. And very easily you could see, given how he'd explained things to me in an interview and then the combination of looking at the personality data in the test result, why the situation had become what it was. It was also relatively straightforward then to look at the GP's diagnosis and see where that had been accurate and see where that had been wrong. Largely based on understanding what type of person had the injury. The third case was one around PTSD, and this was one where I needed to use a fair few tests. The, um, this was a case uh, I was asked to do an assessment for, uh, for the defendant. The defendant was a manufacturing company. And as part of this case, uh, there were a number of things that were not contested. What was not contested was that there'd been a very serious accident this individual had been caught up in. What was not contested was that there was uh, that the accident was near fatal in nature. What was not contested was there had been um, a, a pretty clumsy way of managing the incident, the near fatal incident, and the several days around the near fatal incident. Inclu this included a review of this incident where this individual was singled out and had then very senior members of the company effectively criticise him in public in front of his entire work group. Uh, the incident was later found to be not his fault at all. It's not a great lead-in. But the question was, given this person hasn't worked in several years, is this really PTSD caused by the accident? Or is this something else? The individual in question had a known history of mental health concerns on employment. Was this something else? Was this opportunistic, given the you know, other, other injuries? The person had um, a, a partner who wasn't working and several kids. Is this an opportunity to set them up? Or is this legit? That was the guts of the question. It was phrased more nicely, but that was the guts of it. So as part of the assessment, I interviewed the gentleman twice for about two hours on each occasion. Uh, and I got him to complete several tests. The first was, again, this broad measure of personality that has some pretty subtle measures in there of exaggeration to see to what degree he was exaggerating, if at all. Second was a specific diagnostic interview about PTSD. It's the gold standard interview in psychology for this, for this concern. Uh, and the third thing I included was a specific structured interview that I just put as part of my normal interview so people can't tell it's different, that is designed to screen for malingering, that is designed to screen for individuals who are um, talking about having problems they simply don't have. Oh, it's technically it's for feigning malingering whether they're getting something out. So, but that's what it detects, feigning, uh, and if your judgment supports it, malingering. Going through this, the individual behaved like they had PTSD. 
uh, they struggled to contain emotions at different points. They became really agitated when I corrected them on several things that were pretty important to correct them on. Uh, and uh, they obviously became uh, aggressive uh, with very little stimulation. And these are relatively common things uh, that you see with, with PTSD. What was particularly important for the assessment perspective was that when you looked at the psych test data, there was no sign of exaggeration, not one, not a single one. Uh, and his test responses on the, on the large questionnaire that I use, uh, they all matched up with uh, a, a general picture of PTSD. On the structured clinical interview I went through with him that's specific to PTSD, he came out in the zone of moderately to severely impaired with PTSD. And on the test of the, 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 the interview that detects tendencies towards feigning, he did not score within the range that would be at all supportive of feigning as an outcome. Uh, he scored a couple of points, uh, but it was nowhere near the, the kind of cutoff where you can say, yes, this has moved into a zone of feigning. He was well short of that cutoff. Uh, and sorry, I used a fourth test, which was again, a, a questionnaire specific to PTSD that again has uh, a measure of exaggeration. It's, it's, it's not a great measure, but it is a reasonable one. Uh, and he was nowhere near that either. So going through that, uh, I don't think that the defendants were wrapped with the report, but I checked in four different ways and with an interview as to whether this person had symptoms congruent with the diagnosis, whether there was a better explanation, which there wasn't, um, whether there was an explanation about whether this was a, a chronic condition and an acute condition. Uh, and the answer was that probably was true. I think there was a reoccurrence of his previous condition and PTSD on top of that. But also I was really confident based on multiple different checks that he was not making this up and he wasn't exaggerating. And the final case, uh, the fluorolites cause seizures. This was, a, for me, a really good example of a complex diagnosis made more complex by a complex personality. So functional neurological disorder is a really interesting uh, problem. Functional neurological disorder is when someone suffers from a neurological condition with no neurological basis. That is, for example, someone who experiences epileptic seizures, but if you measure their brainwave patterns, there's no sign of epilepsy before, during, or after a seizure, none but they have seizures. Uh, these sorts of problems used to be called conversion disorder. Conversion disorder was thought to be, when it was first kind of thought of and, and brought into uh, diagnostic manuals, was thought to be a situation where someone's emotional state is so overwhelming for them that they can't deal with it. And, and unconsciously, without even noticing, their brain just shuts off other functions, which then concern the person more than the emotional concern does. We don't call it conversion disorder anymore. Functional neurological disorders have been known and recorded in human history um, since the days of you know, the Egyptians and papyrus. In fact, the earliest um, um, recording of conversion disorder dates back to um, Egyptian papyrus recordings. 15% uh, of people in you know, neurology clinics in Australia are there because of functional neurological disorder. There was an article about this just a couple of years ago uh, from um, a group of Australian neurologists looking at this condition. It's really poorly understood because it is so strange, but it has a long history in medicine. What's difficult then is for other people to understand it. What do you mean the person's going to have migraines if they're exposed to perfume, but they have, but there's nothing wrong with their, their neurological state? What do you mean they're going to have seizures, but they're not epileptic? Uh, another example of functional neurological disorder, things like um, various forms of sensory disturbance or paralysis. For example, you can get a phenomenon named glove paralysis, where you experience paralysis in the shape of a glove in your hand. Only that's not the way the nerve pattern would actually sit. The nerve pattern doesn't look like a glove. And yet, if you touch people here, they can feel it. And if you touch people here, they say they can't. It just doesn't match the nerve patterns. But this happens with functional neurological disorder. So I was referred to an individual where this diagnosis was known. And the individual in question had made a series of requests. Can I have a car park near work? No one had a car park near work. Um, can I sit on the south side of the building, but near the windows so I can get natural light, but the light's not too intense and it's not near the fluoros because I know the fluoros set me off. Can I have a, you know, an ergonomic desk and chair? That were the least of the issues. Um, 
But really, the, the, the referral was, if I broke it down, the referral was the manager saying, this person's being fussy. Do I really have to do this? And the answer was, yes, you do. The individual who was experiencing functional neurological disorder was really prickly, clever. I would estimate once, once not reacting to stuff, very capable and very good at their job. But doesn't suffer fools and is a bit predisposed to thinking everyone might be a fool. So as a result, they're, they're, they can be a prickly person and difficult to deal with. And what was evident looking at the psych testing was that they had a kind of classic pattern in the, in the psych profile of an individual who is genuinely difficult to work with, particularly as an authority figure. Um, colleagues, not so much, but authority figures, absolutely. Uh, this individual doesn't know this about themselves. They're not aware of how they do this, but they absolutely did it. And so this case was useful insofar as uh, the psych testing was useful insofar as I could actually explain um, as part of the IME, yes, the person's capable of working. Yes, these accommodations are reasonable. Explain the nature of functional neurological disorder, but also say the other concern is the way the person tries to get these accommodations made. And it's often in um, uh, ways that are you know, confronting, argumentative, demanding, and then when, when someone equivocates, um, is likely to then put in complaints or write to the manager above the manager and, and as a result creates a fuss within an organisation that then creates pushback and resentment, quite normally and understandably. But that pattern could be explained because I could understand, I think one of the, one of the gifts of psychometrics, I could understand the nature of the person with the problem, not just the problem, not just the problem. Uh, so they're the, they're the four cases in question. Um, and we're running out of time. I'll stop the presentation at this point in time uh, and open up the floor to questions if anyone has any questions that they'd like to jump on a mic and ask or uh, if they want to put them into the chat. Uh, and also, if people don't have time now, they've watched the YouTube later, they can always send questions in to MAG and Michelle and I can get onto them um, via Michelle later on. Absolutely. Uh, Tim, thank you so much. That was outstanding, very thorough and comprehensive. Uh, I learned a heap of stuff about that. Um, absolutely incredible. Now I understand why my glove. <laughs> but, <laughs> I didn't know we were sharing. Uh, that, <laughs> no, that was really, really interesting. And I, I thank you very much for your time. Um, we have got somebody with their hand up. So if you would like to uh, unmute yourself, Chris, Hi. and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Awesome. Hi. Thank you very much for all that. That was very interesting. I've, I've got a few questions, but I'll just stick to one because I don't want to drag the session out as well. Uh, when you were speaking earlier about the difference between clinical and consultant psychs, I just wanted to sort of get your opinion on whether or not there would be a difference in legal weighting of their diagnosis, if uh, that makes sense in my question in a way. So, you know, would there be preferential uh, to get one over the other or would it depend on the case or if they had... Uh, there was a situation where they had differing diagnoses. What would you say would be a, a, the more sort of preferential one to go with, if that makes sense? I'm not going to be able to answer your question because I think that's best answered by a lawyer. Oh, um, interesting. <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to tell you that that if you go back to the GP example, a, a clinical opinion and no backup is is no match for a clinical opinion and backup. But the question is is beyond that. Is a, is a court, uh, either, either um, a, a judge or a jury, going to be swayed more by the perceived authority of a psychiatrist or a psychologist? I, I think in society, um, psychiatrists, particularly in Victoria, um, are given a particular degree of legal weight. Um, my perspective on that is unless the, unless the, uh, uh, the individual is a superb practitioner with an enormous degree of experience, um, not including... Um, psychometric testing is a relative weakness. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. Absolutely. Christine. Now, there's a, there's a question in the chat that I'll just read out. For, oh, medico, for medico legal purposes in the context of financial gain, would mm. you believe that psychometric tests are required for a correct diagnosis? I think psychometric tests are required for a correct diagnosis all the time. 
Um, in the context of medical legal assessment, absolutely. Uh, and it just, again, it allows you to answer those two questions. Who's the person? Who's the person with the thing? And what are we, are we able to, to reliably detect um, forms of manipulative behaviour? And, and to, to, to speak to this briefly, humans are good at being manipulative. Um, children can lie from an incredibly early age. Um, they can steal from an incredibly early age. And in fact, being able to lie and do social white lies is a sign of social sophistication for humans. So deception is common for people. We are a deceptive bunch. Um, we need to deceive to be successful socially. It's not a nice idea, but it's absolutely true. Uh, and we're not that great at detecting it. We, we, and we overestimate our ability to detect it. So if you want to be certain about this stuff, I think it, it, it's crazy not to measure it because of all of those factors. Absolutely. Well, look, everybody, I thank you so much for making time today to join us for this talk with the amazing Dr. Tim Doyle. And Tim, I thank you for the time and preparation that's gone into this really informative seminar and for your time today. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Let me stop that recording.